بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على سيد الرسل وخاتم الانبياء وعلى اله الاذكياء واصحابه الاتقياء اما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لو انزلنا هذا القران على جبل لرايته خاشعا متصدعا من خشيه الله <تصفيق> وتلك الأمثال نضربها للناس لعلهم يتفكرون صدق الله العظيم The greatest mission of the life of the Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم was to fulfill the role of a messenger and the role of a messenger is to deliver a message The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم had many great miracles in his life However, the greatest miracle of the Prophet ﷺ was none other than the Qur'an. For it, is the, for it is a miracle that remained even after the Prophet ﷺ left this world. Until today, if we wish to understand who the Prophet ﷺ actually was, and for us to understand who our Lord Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, the only way to this You know, to this goal is to read and understand the Quran. The companions they came to Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha on one occasion and they asked her, describe to us the character of the Prophet Muhammad. She replied back by saying, The character of the Prophet Muhammad was the Quran. Now, this Quran is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam while explaining the greatness of the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says that the excellence of the Qur'an, the excellence of Qur'an over all other books is like the excellence of the speech of Allah over all the speech of mankind. If you were to create, compare the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with my speech or your speech, what kind of comparison would that be? Now imagine the greatness of the Qur'an and its rank in comparison to all of the books in the world. The Prophet wasallam, he enlightened the hearts of people with the Qur'an. People were guided through the Qur'an. A nation which will be such a large nation on the Day of Judgment. For the Prophet wasallam, desired to have the largest nation on the Day of Judgment. When we gather together, our actual source of guidance is nothing other than the Qur'an. That's why the Prophet wasallam he encouraged his companions to read it frequently. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, encouraged his companions to recite it. The Prophet wasallam encouraged his companions to memorize it. The very beautiful hadith that you can find in the, Sah the Sahihain in Bukhari and Muslim, the Prophet wasallam told his companions that there is no such thing as being envious but for two people. Don't be jealous or envious over anyone but for two people. The first person the Prophet ﷺ says is that person who Allah gave the Qur'an to, meaning he's memorized the Qur'an. And not only has he memorized the Qur'an, but he wakes up during the hours of the night and he prays it in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Be jealous and be envious of that person because he has something you don't have. The second thing the Prophet ﷺ said Be envious of the person who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave wealth to and he spends it in the darkness of the night, meaning he spends it secretly without exposing his deed to the entire world. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was regular in reciting the Qur'an and he used to enjoy the recitation of the Qur'an. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he would start the recitation of the Qur'an in the hours of the night, the prayer would become so long that Aisha radiallahu anha herself is saying, that the beloved feet of the Prophet ﷺ would swell. And this wasn't something that happened one or two nights, this was a regular routine of the life of the Prophet ﷺ. Our beloved reciter at the beginning, he recited the verses of Surah Muslimin. And in these verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the initial stages of Islam, ordered the companions and the Prophet ﷺ to spend a great portion of their night worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they would stand in front of Allah in the Hajjid for long hours. And the companions couldn't bear it anymore because their feet were swelling up. And they couldn't bear it anymore because it was hard on them. They were standing for long hours. 
And the scholars of Tafsir, they say, Ibn Kathir alayhi, says that this order of standing for long hours actually remained for close to one year. How many years? One year. Imagine that. One year of standing for Nisrahu awin qusminhu qalila qumil layla illa qalila. And you know, these verses of Allah is saying, stand during the night, but a little bit. Nisrahu or half of it. Oh, you know, a wit husband who can or a little less than a half. Oh, Zid Alehi or a little more than that. Allah Azza wa Jalla is saying that spend the majority part of your night standing in front of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, worshiping Allah Azza wa Jalla. What the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went through to receive this Quran was great, and this is one thing we, as the Muslim community, truly misunderstand and we do not appreciate. We had, we think for a moment that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the revelation that was given to him was easy. Some of us think of revelation like the Prophet said of going to the local market, making a payment, and walking out with a bag of revelation. Well, the reality is far from that. And the, and the Shaykh at the Qadi Sahib at the beginning, he recited that verse. Inna salulti alayka qawlan faqilan. Allah Azza wa Jal says that indeed we are to reveal to you a very heavy statement. And it was so heavy on the Prophet that the Prophet feared his life when revelation was revealed unto him. Imagine that for a second. You know, if I told you you have to cross this wire right here, this rope right here, from one, one high-rise building to the other high-rise building, cross this rope on balancing yourself without, follow without falling down, because on the other side there is a message that you have to deliver to these people. Most of us would never risk our life for another person. <coughs> here the Prophet wasallam, and almost every other day, or every few days, when the revelation comes down to him, he feels this weight onto him. And the Prophet said one day while he was lying down on the thigh of another companion, the companion says that revelation began to reveal to the Prophet. And there was such a heavy weight that I actually thought my thigh was going to crush because of the weight of revelation. Aisha radiallahu anha says that when revelation would come to the Prophet, even in the winter season, sweat would begin to, 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 to appear on the forehead of the Prophet. The first revelation when Jibreel is squeezing the Prophet during the revelation of Iqra, while he's squeezing the Prophet, the Prophet each time he says that he squeezed me until the point that I thought I would be destroyed, meaning that was the end of my life. Each time he squeezed me, he squeezed me, he squeezed me. When we talk about the sacrifice of the Prophet, it seems we forget this one point. But the Prophet went through such a long journey of life preserving the Qur'an. And when he was given the Qur'an, he was worried about it. The Prophet when the Qur'an was revealed to him, you have to understand he had a responsibility. That responsibility was now to, to you know, attain this revelation and convey it to the people. Therefore the Prophet when the revelation would come down to him, he would quickly repeat the verses of the Qur'an so he wouldn't forget it. He would come, you know, he would just be repeating them again and again and again and again. You know how we repeat our phone numbers again and again to make sure we don't forget them? He would repeat the words of the Qur'an, for, you know, again, fast, 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 to make sure he wouldn't forget them. And Allah Azza wa Jalla, he says to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, لا تحرك به لسانك لتعجلني There's no need for you to worry about repeating it frequently. إِنَّا عَلَيْنَا جَمْعَهُ وَالْقُرْآنَ We promise you that once you've gone through the hardship of taking the revelation, we will make sure you never lose it again. Inna alayna jama'ahu wa qur'ana. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he lived for this. The greatest gift the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave to the ummah today is nothing less than the Qur'an itself. You know, the companions, they had such great value for the Qur'an. The hadith is in, you know, you can find the hadith in Sahih Muslim, that there was a young man, he wanted to learn the Qur'an. But he lived far from the city of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Medina Munawwar. And he couldn't travel to Medina Munawwar. So what he would do is he would stand outside his city limits on the pathway that led to Medina Munawwar. And when the caravans would go, would return back from Medina Munawwar, when they would be heading out from Medina Munawwar, he would go to the people of the caravan and ask them, have you learned any new verse? Have you learned any new verse? Have you learned any new verse? And if they learned a new verse, they would read it for him. Otherwise, he would pass them on and wait for the next caravan to come. Where is that nation gone that cared so much for the Qur'an? That made such a great sacrifice to stand in the middle of the day, in the burning hours of Arabia, just to learn a few verses. You know, our teachers used to tell us a story. I remember one of my teachers, if I'm correct, Sheikh Shu'aib, he, he taught us Adab, and he told us this one beautiful story. He said to us that, you know, when Russia, when the Muslims in Russia were overpowered by communism, and they were going through great oppression, to be a Muslim was a crime. 
communism, right? It speaks for itself. And the Muslims weren't even allowed to hold Qur'ans with them. What they would do is they would dig in their houses, basements, small cellars, and they decide that they would have a tunnel that would lead to another cellar. And then inside that bottom cellar, right in the corner, they would have a small room where there would be Qur'ans, there would be candles there, and they would secretly sit there and read Qur'an. You know, where were people gone who actually went out of their way to read Qur'an? Today, every person in this gathering here has a cell phone in their pocket, and we all have easy access to the Qur'an. But the problem with life is that when things become easy, we lose value for them. When things become easy, we lose value for them. But when they're hard to achieve, you have the value for it. You know, there was, I went to Umar al-Hajj a few years back, and I was sitting in Medina Munawara behind the road of the Prophet, behind the grave of the Prophet And there was a man from Mauritania, he was sitting next to me. So he was sitting next to me, I was sitting here, I was just waiting for Salah, so I was just reading some Qur'an. I had memorized the Qur'an, so I was reading it off by heart. This man looked at me and he said to me, Assalamu alaikum. So I said, Wa alaikum salam. He said, where are you from? I said, I'm from America. He said, you're reading the Qur'an off by heart. I said, Alhamdulillah, I memorized the Qur'an uh, and I live in America. He said, literally, you know, he gave me this like, you know, OMG look. He's like, a Muslim in America? There's Muslims in America? I was like, yeah, there's a lot of us actually. We have a lot of Muslims and we actually have Islamic institutes. We have, you know, hip factories. I call these hip schools hip factories. Because they just keep producing new students to the community, more and more children. You know how many kids in our community have memorized the Quran? I'm sure London is probably greater than Chicago. How many kids have memorized the Quran? It's a miracle. It's such a beauty that so many people have memorized the Quran. And we got into this conversation, then, you know, by nature, I flipped the question on him. I said to him that, do you guys have, you know, and where are you from? He said, I'm from Mauritania, in Africa. And I said to him, wow, you're from Mauritania. You know, have you memorized the Quran? And then he gave me that look again, like your crazy look. He's like, what? I was like, have you memorized the Quran? He said, me memorize the Quran? Every single person that's related to me has memorized the Quran. I was like, whoa, that's crazy. Everyone's memorized the Quran. He's like, my mother, my father, my sisters, my uncles, my aunts, my wife, my children, my cousins, everyone, the entire family's memorized the Quran. I was like, wow. But then he looked at me and he said to me, I want to tell you a little secret. I was like, yes. He said, we don't memorize the Quran the easy way like you guys do. He was getting challenging now, right? Confrontation. I was like, really? Tell me what your big challenge is. I'll show you my challenge too. So the next thing he told me, I realized that he was right. We have it the easy way out. He said that when we come to the madrasa in the morning, our teacher has a big blackboard and he has a piece of chalk. And each student in the madrasa, if you, when you enroll into the HIFT program, they give you a small little tablet like this, you know, like a small little blackboard, and they give you a chalk. And when you come to the school, the teacher will write the ayah of the day on the chalkboard. You have to write it on your small chalkboard, and then you have 24 hours to see that ayah. How many, how many hours do you have? Then the next morning, what happens to that? They wipe it off for the next ayah, and you're never going to see that ayah again. It's gone. He said, in our community, we can't afford hard copies of the Qur'an. So this is how we memorize it. And I was thinking, la ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. People who don't have copies of the Qur'an value it. And those who have copies of the Qur'an, they let dust grow on it. Where was a, where was a community gone who actually valued the Qur'an? You know, who actually cared for the Qur'an? You know, the companions of the Prophet are of different ranks. You guys are aware of that, right? There were those before migration, there are those after migration. <coughs> then from the companions, there are those who participated in the Battle of Badr. And the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he testified for them saying that this group of companions who participated in the Battle of Badr are forgiven companions. Allah Azza wa Jalla is going to grant them Jannah. You guys are aware of these narrations, right? Yes, no? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's a surah in the Quran called Surah Al-Anfal. What is the name of the surah? Al-Anfal. Very beautiful. Anyone know what the word Al-Anfal means? What was that? Shaykh. Not the shield, you guys. <laughs> Spoils of war, very good, who's that? MashaAllah, very good, MashaAllah, except for me. Spoils of war, yes. Al-Anfal is referred to as the spoils of war. What happened was that one of the first battles that took place in Islam was the Battle of Badr. And in this Battle of Badr, the second year of Hijrah, after the batter, uh, battle was over, they received the spoils of war. You know, someone's armor, someone's sword, someone's horse. They gathered it all together. Now the young companion said that we should get a bigger portion. 
because we were the fighters. The elderly companion said, no, we should get the bigger portion because we were the brains behind the battle. There was a little conflict here now. They came to the Prophet and they asked the Messenger of Allah, who gets what from the spoils of war? Revelation came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet recited to them, يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الْأَنْفَالِ قُلِ الْأَنْفَالُ لِلَّهِ وَالرَّسُولِ Allah Azawajal says that they ask you regarding the spoils of war, tell them you don't get anything. It's all for Allah and the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You don't get anything out of it at all. Now this verse was actually abrogated by the verse of the first, the first verse of the 10th juz of the Quran, where Allah Azawajal then gives them a portion. The reason why they were first told very clearly that you don't get anything was so that the Sahaba can rectify their intentions. They don't fight for the sake of the spoils, for the sake of Allah Azawajal. And then Allah Azawajal reveals the verse that abrogates it. Until the end of the ayah, Allah Azawajal splits that, the, the categories of the people who benefit from the spoils of war. Now in this very same surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the following verses, He describes the companions who participated in the battle of Badr and explains their reason of victory. How are the companions victorious? Now I want you to really subjectively look at this battle. The companions are 300 more or less in number, underarmed. They're standing there with sticks, most of them on their feet, without any armor on their body. They came to stop a caravan, not to participate in warfare. On the other hand, you have a thousand men who left their homes with the intention for battle. They're dressed in armor. They have swords. They have shields. Many of them are on horses. They have their spears with them. They're on their camels. These people were ready for battle. They were so ready for battle that they actually came with a confetti to the battlefield. You guys know what confetti is? Right? The celebration. Right? They throw confetti in the air. They came with their mus musical instruments that we're going to celebrate over these guys in the battlefield. Right? And their women came out with them so they can celebrate the victory as soon as they were going to squat the Muslims in the battle of Badr. Now you look at this. You have a man here who's just migrated. When they arrived in Medina Manawara, you know, we all know, for those of us who studied history at least, that the Sahaba were very weak. They became very weak and ill because of the weather in Medina Manawara. So they're standing there, and most of them are weak, they're skinny, you know, they, they're not even ready for war, they're just standing there with whatever they have. And in front of them you have these huge soldiers, and they're ready for war. And the Sahaba are looking at them. And Allah he says that this battle was a very big battle. Yawm al taqal furqan. Right? This was the day where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah azza wa jalla, He proved who, Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu, they were worried, the companions were very worried when they looked into the eyes of the enemy. When they were looking into the eyes of the enemy, they were worried. And Allah azza wa jalla gave them console when He revealed the verse of the Quran, Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu, idha laqeetum fi'atan, fathbutu, wathkuru Allah kafiran la'alakum tuflihun. All those who believe when you meet your enemy, idha laqeetum fi'atan, when you meet the enemy, fathbutu, stand firmly. Don't shake. Wathkuru Allah kafiran. Remember Allah abundantly. لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ Perhaps this will help you be victorious in the battlefield. Now this battle is just about to commence and they're about to start. And this beautiful battle, you know, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great moment in the history of Islam. How these companions, 300 more or less of them, end up defeating their enemy. And they are victorious in the battle of Badr. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the verses of Surah Al-Anfal, He tells us of five things that the Sahaba held that caused them victory in the battle of Badr. How many things? Five. five things. What were the five things? They had great cardio, they all had gym membership, protein shakes, they were very flexible, and these guys were very good at archery. No, none of these things. These guys didn't have protein shakes. They didn't have, you know, gym membership. These guys weren't going to, you know, LA Fitness or Export or none of this stuff. They were body lifting. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he talks about the five characteristics the Sahaba had that caused them victory in the battle of Badr, what are they? Allah Azza wa Jalla says in the very same, very same surah al anfal next ayah after that. These are the five characteristics they have. What are they? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِنَّمَا in Arabi, for those of you who are aware of the language, is for hasr. That ma, that innama is for hasr, which means that only, it's to, it's to exclude anything other than that. The true believers, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ The true believers are those that when they hear the name of Allah, their hearts tremble. Can you imagine that? 
Imagine what kind of deep love you have to have for someone that just by hearing their name, it brings a smile to your face. You know, you haven't seen your mother in years. Imagine this. You haven't seen your father in years. And you meet someone who has the same name as your father or mother, what does that do to your face? It brings a smile to your face. You see someone that just resembles your beloved, it brings a smile to your face. My teacher, Sheikh Bilal, used to give an example of true love. He used to say that there was a student that used to go to the madrasa. And madrasa is the Islamic school. So on the way to the madrasa, there was a lady that he would cross by every time. And that lady would be standing by her door, and she used to stare at him. And when he would pass by, she would go back into her house. On the way back, he'd be walking past, and that very same lady was standing there. She would be staring at him. So this had happened for some time. This lady was, you know, in our words, somewhat stalking him. She was looking at him as he was passing there, there and back. Finally, one day when he was passing, the lady came to him, she confronted him, and she said, My dear friend, young man, I have a request. He said, Yes, what's your request? She said, I'd like to invite you to my house for dinner. And he's like, What? You want to invite me to your house for dinner? You've been looking at me for all these days, and now you want to invite me? But at the end of the day, like all mothers of students, you can never turn down the offer of a free dawah. So he said, I'll be there. So the next morning he showed up to the house. Next, not next morning, next day, he showed up to the house, the lady's house. When he walked inside the house, here's an old lady. He walked inside the house and she had spread this beautiful tablecloth with all this food, starters and this and that. All this, and she put, a, she put a grand dinner in front of him. He didn't ask any questions. That wasn't his responsibility. He just started jamming down the food. And he's eating away, eating away, eating away. And finally, after he's done eating, he says to the lady, okay, now what's the occasion? After he's done eating, he says, what's the occasion? The lady says to him, look, the truth of the matter is, I really don't know you. Neither do, I, neither do I care about you. The only reason why I stand here every day and watch you as you pass by, the only reason why I called you here today to my house for dinner is because I had a son who passed away. And he looked exactly like you. And before he passed away, he was traveling, and I always had a dream to have one meal with my son before he passed away. And she says, I stood here by the door every day. When I would see you, I would remember my son and would bring peace to my heart. And I would feel so good just standing here looking at you. And in order to fulfill that last desire of mine, I invited you to my house. And these dishes on the tablecloth right here were all the dishes my son used to love to eat. So I had one last meal with my son again. See, that's what love is. That when you see someone, it directly impacts your heart. You know, if you, for those of you who are married, I want you to rewind, rewind back to the time where there were two, three days left for your engagement. Not even marriage. Two, three days left for your engagement. The proposals were made, and you're going through the thinking process. And right when someone said your fiancé's name, what kind of emotional effect would that have on you? Bring a smile to your face. You start blushing a little bit. A text message, and your friends are looking at you like, I don't know who that text came from. Mm -hmm. right? You know, where emotion, when, when you're really attached to someone, it has a big impact on you. You know, the uncles are giggling. I stop, man. <laughs> I really wasn't asking you guys to think about it. It's one of those questions that you're not supposed to respond to. Rhetorical question. And anyway, you know, this is what you call real love. The companions have this love. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this is the love a believer has. You know my teacher, Shaykh Yusuf Mutala Sahib, who I studied Sayyid Bukhari from, he said something very beautiful. And please don't take this statement of his as a fiqh, as a, as a fiqhi ruling or a legal matter. He, that's not what he was trying to convey. He was trying to convey a very deep spiritual point. He said that the greatest sin a person can ever commit, and again, please don't take this as a legal ruling. This is just a statement <coughs> to ponder over. He said the greatest sin a person can ever commit is to say the name of Allah without meaning it, without having love. That's a big sin. To just say the name of Allah without your heart craving that love that a person should have in their heart when saying the name of Allah. <coughs> you say the name of your children, you smile and say it. You make, you, you make gestures while you say it. And when it comes to the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, today it's so passive that people can sit here, you know, Hassan Basri used to say, our istighfar requires another istighfar because of how terribly we did the first istighfar. Now that's the state. Allah is always while describing these companions who participated in the battle of Badr. The first thing he said is, The true believers are those that when they hear the name of Allah, their hearts tremble and their hearts shake. They have a very serious connection with Allah. Tears fall out of their eyes. Their heads turn and they say, Did I hear Allah somewhere? You know, did I hear someone talking about Allah? I want to join this conversation. I have to be a part of it. Not move away from it. The second thing, 
When they heard the recitation, when they heard the verses of the Quran being recited in front of them, their faith would increase. How many of us can actually make this claim that when I hear the Quran being recited, it actually increases my faith? Most of us stand at the back without even knowing what the Quran is saying. And how do we justify standing back there by saying that, oh, I don't speak the Arabic language? Well, if you don't speak the Arabic language, then you have a responsibility to understand what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying. We all have a responsibility to learn some basic Arabic so we can at least understand what is being recited in the Quran, what, what is being recited in the Salah. How many of us sitting here can confidently, you know, on a board, on a whiteboard, write down the correct translation of Al-Fatiha? The Surah Fatiha that we recite every day in our soul. How many of us can actually write it down confidently on a whiteboard and say, that is the exact translation? We're, we lack in confidence. That's where our distance and that's where our connection is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's where our connection is with the Qur'an. And then what we've done is that not only have we distanced ourselves from the Qur'an, but we've substituted the Qur'an and its spiritual effect with filthy things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Qur'an says that the, that the remembrance of Allah is the true cause of contentment. But today you ask a person that if you want contentment, most young people, most young men, and even our adults, you know, the, the, the truth is the truth. When they're sitting at work, when they're bored, how many of them actually turn the Qur'an on? When you're, when you're driving your cab around, how many of us actually turn the Qur'an on? When you're getting ready for your exam the next morning or in a few hours, how many of us put some Qur'an on to cool our nerves down? Most of us are listening to music. And we've, we've replaced filth. We've replaced filth. And we've, we've taken this filth and, we, and, and we've moved out the purity. The purity has been replaced with filth. And this is where we are today. I remember I went to my teacher, Sheikh Bilal, who we studied Sunnah Nasa'i from, and I asked him, Sheikh, I have a question. Why is it that people feel contentment through music and they don't feel contentment with the Qur'an? Most people, while they're listening to the Qur'an, they doze off, they're just, you know, here and there, they don't enjoy it as much. Why do they enjoy listening to Bollywood out of all the things in the world? You know, Bollywood is terrible poetry and terrible music. You know, it's an FYI. And the same thing with Hollywood music, you know, your MTV music. It's all, filled with, it's all full of profanity and, and foul language and foul messages. You listen to the stuff that our youth are listening to today and you'll be ashamed. You'll feel shocked at yourself. We'll come to that very soon. So I asked him this question. He said to me, I'll explain to you through a story. <coughs> and he told me this story, a very interesting story. He said what happened was that there was a man. He was a bungee. You guys know what a bungee is? A bungee is a person who carries the filth from the houses of the people, the stool and urine from the houses of the people, and dumps it in the wasteland. People didn't have drainage systems, so they would, you know, relieve themselves <coughs> in a pot or some basket at home, and a man would come, he would collect all the filth from everyone's house on a big basket, carry it on his head, and go to the dump yard and, and toss it out there. This is what we call a bungee, right? Or, you know, they also call it a mehta, a person who gathers the filth and throws it out. So, there was this man, he, he, used to, he was collecting the filth for everyone's house, like one stool and you know, their waste. And he was carrying it and he was going, and while he was going, he fainted. Now imagine what happened to that basket. It fell over. So everyone in the pathway were like, ew, that's yucky, that's nasty. And they stopped. A crowd came around, they saw this guy was on the ground, he was out of his senses. They tried to put fragrance there, wake him up. He wasn't waking up. So one man was passing by and he saw there was a big uh, crowd in the pathway. He said to the people, why are you guys all gathered here? They said, because someone fainted. He cut through the crowd, came to the front, and he saw the guy that fainted there was his co-worker. So he went to the guy, and he saw someone was trying to put fragrance by his nose. He said, brother, this doesn't work with him. He's around impurity all day. This is what you have to do to make this guy up. And he stuck his finger inside the stool, and he took it out and put it by his nose. And that guy woke up. Ah! Right? He woke up right away. Right? And this is where our sheikh used to say, my teacher used to say, for pure people is purity, and for impure people is impurity. When you train your body to be excited by impurity, that's what happens. You lose, you become desensitized, you lose that connection with purity. You know, that purity, you lose connection. I once had the opportunity to speak at a youth camp. You know, hundreds of youth had gathered together for a camp. The camp, they were outside the masjid in the camping, you know, campgrounds and the cabins, and I was invited to speak there. So they had this special session at nighttime. And that special session was where the youth gathered together and they present skits. They call it entertainment night. So someone will do this skit, someone will do that skit. All the youth will be sitting there and they'll be performing skits. So one of the young men, he said to me, Sheikh, we'd like for you to participate in our entertainment night. So usually I don't participate in this stuff, but because they really insisted, I said, okay, I'll watch it. So I was sitting on the bench in the back and I was observing them with their skits and their entertainment. And three hours had passed by. How many hours? Three hours. 
us. And they were doing so many crazy things. It was funny. It was, it was funny. It was really good entertainment session, to be honest with you. But the, after, it, after it ended, I called all the youth nearby and I said to them, look, this is not my place to speak because I was invited as an observer for this particular session, but I have to say something to you guys. For three hours, you guys performed an entertainment <coughs> night, and at the beginning, or at the middle, or at the end, at no point did you guys ever consider the Qur'an as entertainment. No one recited the Qur'an at all. This is where we are today. We think of entertainment being movies. We think of entertainment being TV. We think of entertainment being our TV shows, our internet, our phone, you know, our radio. But how many people actually gain that true contentment and they can entertain their soul and body simply through reading the Qur'an? And here you have the Prophet wasallam. He comes to Abdullah ibn Mas'ud and he says to him, Ibn Mas'ud, read some Qur'an to me. And Abdullah ibn Mas'ud says to the Messenger of Allah, how can I read the Qur'an to you when it was revealed unto you? The Prophet wasallam says, well, I like to listen to it from someone from my ummah. So Abdullah ibn Mas'ud says, I sat in front of the Prophet wasallam, and I started the recitation. And he started reading from Surah An-Nisa. Which Surah? Surah An-Nisa. And he says, I kept reading, and I just had my head down. I was nervous, and I just kept reading. You know how you, imagine when you lead the Raweeh prayer, you lead it Maghrib or Isha prayer, you know how you get nervous? If you're pushed forward as an Imam? Here he's reading to the Prophet wasallam. This is a real game now. This is not, you know, some side game. It's not going to get any more intense than this. He's reading to the, you know, the Prophet wasallam. And he says, I was looking down and reading, and I was very tense. And finally, I peeked up a little bit. I peeked up. And I, he said I was reading the verse, فَكَيْفَ إِذَا جِئْنَا مِنْ كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ بِشَهِيدٍ وَجِئْنَا بِكَ عَلَىٰ هَا وَلَاءِ شَهِيدًا The translation of which is, How will that day be? فَكَيْفَ إِذَا جِئْنَا مِنْ كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ بِشَهِيدٍ How will that day be when Allah brings from every nation a witness to testify against them? وَجِئْنَا بِكَ عَلَىٰ هَا وَلَاءِ شَهِيدًا Then over all of these witnesses, we will call you, O Muhammad, to witness over the entire creation, all human beings. And he says, when I looked up, I saw the Prophet ﷺ's face was covered in tears and he was crying away. And he said to me, Abdullah, stop now. Abdullah, stop now. You have made me cry enough. You have made me cry enough. The Prophet ﷺ was one day walking at night time. And Abu Musa al-Ashari is reading the Qur'an. And the Prophet ﷺ likes his melody. He likes his tone. He, he's enjoying it. And he's standing behind Abu Musa al-Ashari And then, you know, he passes on. And after Abu Musa al-Ashari finishes his prayer, someone comes and tells him that you, when you, you know when you were reciting, the Prophet was standing behind you. And he was enjoying your recitation. So he went to the Prophet The Prophet said to him, Abu Musa, you recite good Qur'an, mashallah. He said, O Messenger of Allah, I didn't know you were behind me, otherwise I would have showed you my real game. <laughs> I didn't know you were behind me. If I knew you were behind me, I would have shown you guys what recitation is. But I don't know you were even behind me. You know, where is that gathering gone? Those people who enjoyed the recitation of the Qur'an. We as a community need to build our connection with the Qur'an again. There was a very famous scholar from the Indian subcontinent by the name of Sheikh Al-Hind. Rahimahullah ta'ala, rahmatullah asya. Right? Sheikh Mahmood. And he was a very great scholar, one of the pioneers of the, one of the great institutes of the subcontinent, Dalim Dilwan. And during the colonial occupation, he was arrested and taken into prison. And when he was released from prison some time later, he gave a very beautiful speech. And Shaykh al-Hind ta'ala was a mufakir, he was a thinker. He was a very deep thinker. If you read his books, you read his tafsir, even his, even his footnotes or his brief explanation of the Qur'an, you'll find so much depth inside there that you can actually ponder over his words. So Shaykh al-Hind ta'ala, after sitting in the prison for so many years in Malta, and after being beaten you know, during the night and all this, he had gone through a lot. So he really gave some solid time to think. And when he came out of you know, the, the, the prison, he gave a very beautiful speech. And in this speech he said to the people that today when I look at the Muslim Ummah, I ask myself why is the Muslim Ummah where it is today? Why are we where we are? Because that time, you know, the country was splitting, you know, the, 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 what do you call this, the Brits were, were taking over the country, scholars were being mass murdered, and institutes were being destroyed. He had seen basically a, a nightmare of what Islam was going through, what the Muslims were going through. And he said, today I ask myself, why is Islam where it is, and why are the Muslims going through this? He said, I ask myself this question every day and every night while I was in the prison. When they were beating me, I was thinking in my mind the answer to this question. And he said, today when I walk out of that prison, I have the answer for you. And he said two things. He said, the first thing, our disunity. Today we don't treat each other as brothers. 
Each person looks at the person next to them as a foreigner, but a companion, a friend, someone that they can share a prayer hall with, nothing more than that at all. How many of us sitting here who regularly attend the masjid actually know each other's names? You know, we're united but disunited. And the second thing that he said is because our attachment and our connection with the Qur'an. Today, we do not have connection with the Qur'an. And this is the, one of the last advices the Prophet ﷺ gave as his hajj was con concluding, as it was coming to an end, in the farewell hajj, he said to the companions, تَرَكْتُ فِيكُمْ أَنْرَيْنَ لَن تَضِلُّ إِنْ تَمَسَّكْتُمْ بِهِمَا I am leaving behind with you two things. You can never be misguided as long as you hold firmly to them. Don't let go. Don't let go. Kitab Allah Sunnati. The book of Allah in my way. You know, today our situation is such that many adults in our community, let alone the kids, can't even recite the Quran properly. You know, I'm not sitting here to put anyone on a guilt trip, but so that we have a realization. You know, if you guys lived in some rural city in America, some rural village in America, and you told me you couldn't recite the Quran, I would probably say, Brother, make dua to Allah, Allah help you. But you live in London for crying out loud. How many scholars are sitting in this gathering alone? You know, how many people, the, the recitation, I'm not sure if the Qadi is local or not. Qadi, are you local here? He's local and your imam is local. And I'm, sure, I'm not even sure how many other scholars you guys have here. And you guys, if you as a community cannot recite the Qur'an fluently, and you're not proficient in the recitation of the Qur'an, then we have an issue. Because then it is, it's not about ignorance now, now it's about being careless. It's about being careless. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't like people that are careless. The Prophet doesn't like a person who's careless. We need to step up to our responsibility. When is the last time you've seen people in your community or our community, I refer to myself, you can ask yourself, that we actually cry while we sit in the Qur'an. We cry while we listen to poetry. We cry while we watch Bollywood and Hollywood movies because we don't have anything, we don't have a soul within ourselves. We're such a depressed nation that in order to become emotional, we have to sit in front of a screen, watch some artificial, fake, fictional story, and then bring tears to our eyes and cry. Because we don't know what, we know what a real spirit is, we're hollow from within. You want to build that spirituality, read the Qur'an and learn how to cry. And if you think it's impossible, that is a deception of shaitan to you. Because there are people across this world who cry at hearing the recitation of the Qur'an. Shia Sulfiqar, a very famous scholar from Pakistan, from Jang, he, he's written this story in his book that he, that he, 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 he met Qadi Abdul Basit, he, you know, the very famous Qadi Abdul Basit, of the son of the Basit, he read him, he met him. And he asked Qadi Abdul Basit, tell me the most unique story of your recitation. Tell me the most unique story that happened during your life while we sat in the Qur'an. He says that what happened was that the Russians and the, and the Egyptians were having discussions. You know, Jamal al Nasser was having meetings with the, with the communists, right, with, with the Russians. And he said the leaders of the Russians would meet with the Egyptian leaders frequently. And when, on one occasion what happened was Jamal al Nasser, when he was in Russia, he was meeting with the leaders there and after the meetings were over, one of the leaders said to him that we'd like to entertain you with an entertainment session. And he said these girls came out, they were dancing, and there was some music playing. And Jamal Abdul Nasser said to the Russian leaders after the entertainment session was over, Thanks a lot, but next time let me bring the entertainment. I'll show you guys next time. He came back, he had a message sent to al, al Sheikh al Basit, said to him, Qadir al Basit, I need you for a trip next time, we'll go to Russia together. Qadir al Basit said, safe, let's do it. They, they get there, Qadir al Basit is made to wait outside because there were private meetings. After the meetings were over, they called him in. And Qadir al Basit says that I came inside, and these Russians were sitting there. They didn't even know it. They didn't even speak my language, right? They don't even speak Arabic. They're Russians, and they don't understand Arabic. They're not even Muslims. And he said, "We're sitting there on the table." And Jamal Abdul Nasser gives me that gesture, like, "Go for it now. Show these guys what's up." And he says, "I just said Bismillah, and I just started reading." And I was reading. You know how he gets into the zone, and right? he's putting his hands all over his face, and he's like swaying left and right, not swaying as in dance swaying, but just he gets into the zone when he reads, right? And he said that at some point I looked up during my recitation and all these people were in tears and they were crying. The effect of the Qur'an. Jafar is standing in front of Najashi and Najashi says to him, the Abyssinian leader, king. Najashi says to him, read some Qur'an for me. And, uh, and, and, and Jafar says, okay, here you go. And he starts reading the Qur'an. In some narrations he started reading Surah Yasin. And while he's reading to him, he looks up at some point to see how the king is reacting to the recitation. And he says, when I looked up, Najashi was crying. He wasn't even Muslim at that point. He accepted Islam at that point after hearing the recitation. Allah Azza wa Jal mentions this in the Quran. وَإِذَا سَمِعُوا مَا أُنزِلَ إِلَى الرَّسُولِ فَرَاءَ عَيْنَهُمْ تَفِيدُ مِنَ الدَّمْعِ مِمَّا عَرَفُوا مِنَ الْحَقِّ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا آمَنَّا فَاكْتُبْنَا مَعَ الشَّاهِدِينَ You know, Allah Azza wa Jal says that when they hear the recitation, tears come into their hearts. We need a community that is attached to the Quran. You know, I was once giving a lecture and I was telling the youth, 
that it's inappropriate that many of us have the Quran hanging from our rear view mirror. Have you guys seen that? In the car sometimes they have ayat of the Quran hanging down, or they have a small little Quran that's really, really you guys have seen the small Qurans that come like literally this big? Have you guys seen them? I just want to mention one thing. Most of those Qurans are actually incomplete. Okay, so this is a part this is an important point to know, note down. And I believe that's a big deception because you can't cut out parts from the Quran. The scholars have written against this. This is what we call tahrif. If you're going to print anything less than the complete Quran, you should say very clearly, this is not the complete Quran. When I was in Haramain last time, I found that once because I, I purchased it and I had it in my pocket. And while I was doing tawaf, I needed something to read from. So I said, let's pull it out. I know the print's really small, but I thought I could figure it out if I had any mistakes. I was looking at it, and it was skipping pages. And it was skipping pages. And what's this? And then I found someone that skipped 10 jewels altogether. And then after that, I thought maybe mine was a misprint. I went back to the store, and I was going through his pile, and all of them had, had missing pages inside there. Okay? So be careful of that. You know, in the rear view mirror, one man, he had a, one of my good friends, he had a, a Quran hanging there. And when I got inside his car, he turned the engine on. He was taking me somewhere. He turned the engine on, and the Quran, the, the music started busting. You know how they have that? It started pumping really loud. You have subwoofers in the back. The whole car just started shaking with music. And then he hit the button right away. Sorry, Mufti Saab. That wasn't supposed to happen. <laughs> So I said to him, my dear friend, it's very disrespectful that you listen to the Qur'an. The music so loudly while the Qur'an is hanging here. Is that disrespectful or not? This is what we call jura. You know, you're making a challenge against Allah. That you listen, you have a TV, and on top of the TV you have an adhan clock. Right? right? And horrible scenes are going on in that TV while you have an adhan clock sitting on top of it. And he, you know, so when I told him that it's bad that you're listening to music like this and the Qur'an is here, so you know what he did? Guess what he did? He pulled the Quran off. <laughs> I was like, bro, what are you doing? Put that Quran back and throw that CD out. I'm not asking you to take the Quran, but I'm asking you to take your CD out. You know, we need a group of people that are connected to the Quran. We should encourage people to recite the Quran. We should have gatherings in our homes where we sit down and recite the Quran. Find verses of the Quran, read their meanings, and share their understanding with one another. Obviously through the guidance of your teachers, of your scholars, your imams, but understand some basic ayah. You see a verse regarding Jannah, there is nothing wrong with finding out the translation of what it is. You find a verse regarding Jahannam, there's nothing wrong. Open the verse and read its translation, build a connection with the Quran. I want to finalize the five things, five characteristics, and then this will close. The first thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says regarding the companions who participated in the battle of Badr, that when they heard the name of Allah, their hearts would tremble. tremble. They would shake. The second thing, when they when they heard the recitation of the Quran, what happened to them? No, not cry. Their faith would increase. Zadatun imana. Their faith would increase. The third thing, wa ala rabbihim They relied on Allah subhanahu wa taala. They didn't rely on anyone else other than Allah subhanahu wa taala. And when you look at their companions and their reliance on Allah. It's really intense, man. It's really, really intense. The way they rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anyway, and the, and, the, and the fourth thing Allah says, الَّذِينَ يُقِيمُنَ الصَّلَاةَ What do they do? They establish the prayer. Because the first three things are spiritual. And some people believe that deen is all about being spiritual. But Allah refutes that by adding the fourth thing. What is that? You have to do actions too. You have to pray. And when actions are in two categories, we have the mali ibadah and we have the fi'l ibadah. The monetary actions, and then we have the physical actions, right? The physical deeds and the monetary deeds. So Allah says, الَّذِينَ يُقِيمُ الصَّلَاةِ Those who establish their prayers, referring to the physical deeds. فَبِمَا رَزَقْنَاهُمْ يُنْفِقُونَ They spend in the path of Allah, therefore referring to the monetary deeds. The person who brings all of these things together, actions with his branches, in spirituality, in its totality, in its completeness, Allah Azawajal refers to these people as <coughs> These are the true believers. These are the true believers. We should all make an intention to build a connection with the Quran. The people who have a connection with the Quran are the friends of Allah. Ahlullahi wa khasatu, as the hadith mentions. Right? They are the friends of, the Quran, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And they are the special people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu says, that just as the stars shine in the night, in the earth, the people who recite the Quran, they shine while the rest of the earth remains dark in, in a, from, from an outside perspective. This is the, the, the value of those who recite the Quran. Our, our teacher, Shaykh Yusuf Muttara Sahib, he once told us a story that in South Africa, there was a person, there was a man there, he had memorized the Quran and he was a delivery man. And what he would do is every morning when he would go for his deliveries, when he would turn his engine on, when he would ignite his engine, 
he would start off by reading the Fatiha, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. And he would keep reading it at home when he would come back eight, nine hours later, when he would power down his engine and turn it off, he would read Minas Jimnati Wa Nas. Every single day the man was completing a recitation of the Quran. Every, he never got tired of it. Because the, the, no one ever, the, the reciters of the Quran actually never get tired of it. Our teacher told us of Shaykh um, Zakari Rahimahullah Ta'ala, he used to tell us regarding his teacher, that Shaykh Zakari Rahimahullah Ta'ala, he used to complete the recitation of the Qur'an every third day. How often? Third day. Every third day. You know how many, how, many section, how many portions we have of the Qur'an? How many, how many Jews do we have? 30. You know what these 30 Jews resemble? These 30 Jews were, obviously we know during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu there was no concept of Jews. We all know that, right? There was no such thing as the first Jews, the tenth Jews, the fifteenth Jews. There was none of this stuff. And Malik al Quran, Mufti Shafi with a lot of detail, has discussed the history of where the Jews come from, where the Jews model comes from. And according to one narration, it was a group of the Sahaba who came with the model of dividing the Quran into thirty portions for the for the facilitation of the, of the so the Quran can be recited. And according to his, the second opinion, he says that it was the generation after that came with this model of dividing the Quran into thirty portions so that people can recite it. The reason why the Quran was divided into thirty portions is so that the Qur'an can be completed every single month. The Qur'an's recitation should be completed how often? Every single month. And now you guys may think, oh, that's for the people that have memorized the Qur'an. That's not for us. We have jobs, we have work, we have college. We're too busy for that. Well, that's not true. Because for them, for the Hufad, they created the Manzil model, which is you have to finish the recitation of the Qur'an every single week. If your complaint is that I can't read the Qur'an, because I didn't learn how to do it. If you're complaining that I don't have time to read the Quran, then let me give you guys a compromise to at least start with. Tell me you don't have the ability to listen to the Quran. We all have the ability to listen to the Quran. Yes or no? Yes. We all have these expensive phones in our pocket. We use them for everything but for the sake of Allah. That's crazy. You have the ability to listen to the Quran. You know, if you download the entire Quran on your phone, the average recitation of one just takes half an hour on an audio. How long does it take? Half an hour. And you know, I don't know how it is here, but they say in America, the average person on the way to work and on the way back from work spends three hours on transport. I'm not sure how it works here. They spend two to three hours. If you're spending three hours on transport, how many Jews are, can you listen to possibly in a day? Six. In five days, you can finish the Quran very easily. Very easily. In a comfortable manner, just listening to the Quran and its, and its recitation is done. It'll have, listening to the Quran has a lot of effect. I want to share one more story with you guys and then I'm going to end. You know, I, I, I once went to a dinner. When I went to a dinner, I, after the dinner was over, the host he put the kids to sleep and the adults were sitting inside the, the living room and we were just having some conversation. And all of a sudden I heard the Qur'an being recited loudly on a cassette player. So I asked the host, that, what is this Qur'an being recited so loudly? He said what it is that um, every night when we put our kids to sleep, we put the Qur'an loud, loud and they listen to the Qur'an while they fall asleep. I was like, wow, that's interesting. I said, how did that affect your children? He said, how it affected my children is that my daughter now is 10 years old, and inshallah, next month she'll be completing the Qur'an. I was like, which Qur'an? The Qaeda Qur'an, or Inside Looking Qur'an, or Tajweed Qur'an? He's like, Shaykh, I'm talking about memorization of the Qur'an. 10-year-old girl. And that makes sense to me, because when's the last time you saw someone who actually sat down and printed out the lyrics of a song and said, da -da 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 memorizing it like that. Who memorizes lyrics of song after printing them out and like you know, going line by line? No one does. Most people memorize lyrics of songs by how? <laughs> Just listening. The average lady, she can sing a song while cooking her sadan at home because she's heard that Bollywood song Allah knows a million times. And you're telling me that if you don't listen to the Quran frequently, you're not going to memorize it? It's going to have an effect on you. You know, um, Sheikh Abdul Rahman is sitting here, he can testify to this because this is his classmate's story. Mufti Shabir Sahib was a Sheikh that we studied Tirmidhi from. His older son, Muhammad, is our time up? No? One last story, guys. I'm sorry, guys. These stories are just coming at me. They're coming with such, you know, you know, such force that I just can't stop. Last one, I promise, okay? Mufti Shabir Sahib, we'll end with our teacher's story, okay? Mufti Shabir Sahib was a teacher that we studied Tirmidhi from, and he also taught a portion of Sahih Bukhari to us. When it came time for him to get married, his father asked him, what kind of girl do you want to get married to? He said, my dear father, I'll marry any girl in the world as long as she has memorized the Qur'an. His father said to him that, okay. So he started searching, he found a girl. She was Gujarati, and in the Gujarati community it's important that you marry within the clique. So he's like, that girl, she's Gujarati, and uh, she's also, she's Alima. 
she's a, she, she's a, what do you call it? She cooks good food, and she'll take care of you, and all this other good stuff, right? But the only thing is, she's not half enough. She had not memorized the Quran. He thought about it. His parents wanted him to get married to this lady. He said, you know what? I'll do it. He married her. When he married her, he told, her, he told his wife to look. My biggest, my first mission in life is to make you memorize the Quran. Can, can you imagine telling your wife that? <laughs> I'm going to make you memorize the Quran. Right? Imagine like the look on her face, right? And he made her memorize the full Quran. He made her memorize the full Quran. She memorized the Quran, and then within a few moments after, not too long after her marriage, she was expecting, she was pregnant with Sheikh Abdul Rahman's um, classmate, Sheikh Muhammad. Sheikh Muhammad, when he was born, he went to the Hiv school. He was in one of the Hiv's classes, and you know, he, was, he started memorizing the Quran. And he flew through almost 20 plus juz. How many juz? He flew through them. Then when it came to the last seven, eight juz, he slowed down and it took him almost a year and a half to go through them. So then the teacher came and complained to Mufti Sahib, saying, your son, he used to study hard before, now he doesn't study properly. So when Mufti Sahib heard the whole situation, he said, no, the reality is that the Jews that he flew through were the Jews that his mom was memorizing while she was pregnant with him. <laughs> the Jews that he flew through, these were the Jews that his mom was memorizing when she was pregnant with him. Right? And you think to yourself, wow, that's the effect. You know, doctors tell the women this, right? That when, when doctors, after some, some, some part of the, the pregnancy, they tell the women that talk to your kids, yes or no? Say, talk to your kids. Read Quran to your kids. Read Quran to your kids. It's going to have an effect on them. We should have a house that's full of Quran. We need a car that's full of Quran. We need phones that music goes out in, Quran comes in. These ears, we need to stop oppressing them with music, and we need to start having mercy on them with the recitation of the Quran. Don't give me the excuse that you don't have the ability to listen to the Quran. Don't give me that excuse. Don't give yourself that excuse. Be honest to yourself, make a change, and change our entire community. Make it a wholesome, beautiful, spiritual group, uh, uh, community of ours, and spiritual environment of ours. May Allah Azza wa Jalla accept from us all. SubhanAllah, bihamdihi, SubhanAllah, bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta. أستغفرك ونتوب إليك عفوا دعوانا الحمد لله رب العالمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله